Wahine tua is a construct and I think is a relatively recent one. Um, dare I say it came out of the visual arts and other movements of the late 20th century. Before that was so exquisitely expressed by Robin, um, by Shona Rapira Davies, uh, by Kura Te Waru Rewari, um, in visual and sculptural form, I think that one of the great repositories of mana wahine, of Māori female strength, fortitude, resilience and vision is um, in our literature, in our traditional waiata, motea, tea, haka and poi. Uh, Ngata, of course, and Peite Hurinui Jones, who are both within the archives, um, and of course Terangi Hiroa and Maui Pumare, um, acknowledge this and honour it. The composers, the poets, the creators of traditional Māori literature were primarily female. In the notion of wahine toa, um, you have an idea of a female warrior. We have always been warriors, but certainly um, because we are not a, I don't know how to put this, um, we are not a iwi or tribal society which is um, the same, the expression of female strength, of um, woman power, can vary. And I think that because of the way that we wanted to approach the issues in the 1970s and 80s, we tended to actually um, attempt to standardise and turn everybody into the same thing. And we're not. I think looking back to the 19th century and um, the women who signed the treaty and um, the very few women who participated in the suffrage revolution, and I'm speaking of Māori women, of course, um, you'll note that they are few and far between. You'll also note that they are rangatira, that they are women of substance, women of exalted lineage. They're not your everyday <laughs> flax weaver. <laughs> you know, they're not your everyday mother uh, breastfeeding her baby. They are women of substance. What about the rest? What did they do? If we look at the um, 19th century and consider the, um, the land wars, particularly here in the Waikato, and of course across to uh, Taranaki, one of the few and rare and I think largely unrecognised energies and contributions made during that period was by female fighters and female leaders. And um, that's actually not recorded. Some of it is in the archives. Certainly I found some when we did the um, Te Rohia Mai exhibit in, 1990, in 2013 at the National Library. Um, we, we have to think about them and we have to remember them. Those women were astonishing, and yet they were the 13 whom we have identified as female. We don't know if all those signatures, all the remaining hundreds on the um, is it nine pages, 
or nine versions, are entirely male. I say that a lot. How do you know if you look at a long Māori name if the holder of that name is a male? It's a Victorian 19th century patriarchal construct to assume that the signatories of the treaty were all except 13 or 14 male. I really challenge that. They were in the houses. They were in the Farirunanga. You couldn't keep the likes of Heni Matioro or um, who else? Who would be another one? Rihi Karinga out of those houses. You couldn't. So if the counting was done in the local Farirunanga, there was no way the women were going to leave. Absolutely no way. So I actually suspect that um, in its own quirky and unusual way within the Māori world, with those four electorates, there was a wider suffrage. One of the really exciting things about our people and our history is that, um, and you know, hakoa here, whakaaro whakahihi, even though this is a really arrogant thing to say, I think that um, Māori, um, particularly at that time, were incredibly adaptable, and um, this is reflected in the architecture, particularly, and um, incredibly um, inventive and wonderfully responsive to innovation and change. If you look at the Māori record at the establishment of the Kenitanga, at the relationship between Victoria herself and certain Māori leaders in the Waipa district in the early 1850s, you will find truths and marvels absolutely unexpected and unparalleled. She presented two chiefs with personal portraits. One still exists. It's in the, uh, in the museum in, um, in Tawamutu. And it just makes my heart bleed. Um, it's the kind of story that few people know. Certainly in the early missives um, in which she is personally addressed, um, and this includes, for example, the Fenton Agreement that um, established the township of Rotorua, as well as the various petitions that came from the people of the Taumutu area, as well as all of the different petitions sent from throughout the land, um, she is regarded as a mother, as a matriarch, as a woman of substance, um, and as an approachable human being. You know, as, as a, um, an old world feminist, from way back, like from the very, very early days of the second wave um, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, you know, I would say it's a male problem that the roots of um, so much suffering, pain, social inequality uh, comes from patriarchy, from the male sense of the male god. I believe that. Um, so within our own um, environment, 
within our own ongoing colonial environment, um, despite the likes of the fabulous Helen Clark and the fabulous um, Sean Elias and Lovell Goddards. You know, um, we still have a critically and grotesquely defrauded environment in which the assertion of male power continues unchallenged. I believe that. I do. And those of us that seek to challenge it um, rise and then we can fall again. For me, um, he tangata, a human being, is a human being. Um, and in the understandings of the treaty that we have now, I think the notion of the human being is inherent regardless of sexuality or diversity or actual gender. You know, the treaty is not specific to males and females. It's specific to everyone. To everyone. We're all in there. We're all in there. Those of us, of course, who were actually partners within the relationship. Which brings me to another mad idea too, and it's that, you know, we look at the hundreds of names I'm sure that more than 14 or 15 were female. I'm absolutely sure of that. Because if you look at the way that people are named in my world, my name, Te Awe Kotuku, is a man's name. The assumption, of course, is that the signatory or the marking was a male. We don't know. Everybody yaps on about mana, about mana tangata, you know, about the essential humanness and dignity of being people. And yet in, um, in something like understanding the process of um, negotiating and resolving the wounds and the pain. And here in Hamilton, you know, we are on the site of some of the most horrific battles this island has ever seen. How can we resolve that agony with money? Cannot. It's got to be people sitting down and having children together and enjoying each other's company and really listening. I don't think the treaty itself will ever finish. I think that um, as long as there is a noticeable lack of equity, of justice, of fairness, and a perceived lack, I shouldn't say noticeable, rather perceived lack, um, the grievances um, will never go away. I think that for many of us, the treaty becomes like a potoko manawa around which we can construct an environment in which we can all function equally and joyously. Never give up. Never, never give up. And know that Ahakua Hitao Wairua, even though you can't see us, we are there for you. We are there for you. Just look at our photographs, just look at our carvings, just look at our imagery, and we'll be there for you. <laughs>